Good morning. Great to see everybody this morning. A little chillier out there today, huh? I think wintertime might finally be here. That's a good thing. Uh, if you notice on your bulletin, for those who are visiting, there's a QR code that will take you to a Connect card where if you want some more information about the church, you leave us your information and we'll get in touch with you sometime this week to, to take care of those things. Uh, if you're like me and you're technology challenged, we have papers in the, in the back of the foyer that you can fill out as well and we'll, and we'll get with those. Uh, but right now, let's open our service with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for who you are. You are the sovereign God. There's nothing beyond your power. There's nothing that goes on that you don't know about. Lord, you've created this world in such a perfect way that everything works in sync. And no one can deny, if they really take a deep look, that this world was created by a person, by a God who loves us, who loves us enough that he sent his son to take the penalty of our sin on the cross so that we might have the hope of heaven and eternal life. And Lord, this morning we come to you and praise you for who you are and all the things that you've done for us. And just to give you praise and honor and glory as we come here this morning. Let's do everything to be honoring to you and to lift your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship this morning. It's 
says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. And Psalm 94, 19 says, When my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations delight my soul.
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you don't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. church family. Good Everybody well this morning? Enjoying a cool morning, a cooler morning than we've had recently? We have a number of visitors with us. We're glad you're able to join us this morning. Happy that you're here to worship with us as we assemble to uh, sing praise and give thanks to, uh, to God. I wanted to share with you that on Thursday evening, a number of us get together here at the church for a prayer session. And part of the prayer session that we have is also a thing that we, call, we actually call it praise and prayer. And we use the first several minutes of that uh, to give thanks to God. And remember those things that we may have seen in the past week actually witnessed God in action. Kind of one of those things where uh, we have seen, uh, we've seen, a, 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 I hesitate oftentimes to call it a miracle, but many times that's exactly what it is. Things that we've seen God in action. One of the things I wanted to do this morning was ask if there was anyone here who would like to give thanks to God for something that they've seen recently, recognizing that it was undoubtedly an action from the Almighty. Is there anyone that has a, a, a praise that they'd like to share with the congregation this morning? Yes, okay. Great. Kathy had mentioned, if you didn't hear, that uh, had a relative there that was uh, diagnosed with a brain tumor and uh, gone back in, and it's not there any longer. Whether it was a misdiagnosis or whether it was a miracle uh, remains to be determined, but it was there and now it's gone. Great. One of the things I share with you, we, uh, most every Thursday evening, we have someone, a friend or a relative or a neighbor, that many of us uh, have uh, recognized someone we've known with cancer. And cancer seems to be one of those prevailing uh, illnesses that just continues to manifest itself. And every once in a while, we'll get word that someone who was diagnosed with cancer has undergone some treatment and gone back to the doctors, and it was no longer there. And we really consider that to be just a miracle in the happening, that it's actually God at work. So do, we do recognize those praises. So any of the others that you recognize that is God in action? Yes, ma'am, please. What? Huh? Great, great. Things working well at work. Yes. 
Go. For those of you at home, uh, the blessing was, I guess, for benefits from personally, a personal salvation there, and we thank you for your time and, and acknowledging that to us this morning. Great, great. Tom and I are still waiting for that. I don't know about you, but I think I'll let that one go. Very good, very good. Well. Yes, Larry. Maybe by a bit. <laughs> great, great. Thank you, Larry. For those at home recognizing that uh, praise was given for the uh, program, the watch program, which provides those that are homeless uh, with shelter during the winter months when it's so cold outside. So that's done by a lot of volunteers and a lot of commitment from a lot of individuals so that the homeless uh, do have a place here on these cold winter nights. And it also includes food and just some other things that go above and beyond providing just a shelter. So anyway, certainly appreciation to those people that make that commitment. Yeah, we're always thankful for the individuals who volunteer and commit themselves to the service of the Lord. And we know that there is a, a, a great reward waiting for those that serve, not always on, uh, in this world or in this lifetime, but we know that there are rewards for those that serve God. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I do have, uh, do have a request. Uh, Bev Clark's sister uh, has been ill, and I'll need my spectacles to read that. Bev Clark's uh, sister, Pat Snap, is in the hospital with COVID and a mild heart attack. I'm not sure there is such a thing as a mild heart attack, but anyway, I guess some more serious than others. But she's having uh, catheterization uh, uh, today or tomorrow to uh, check on the blockage of that. So certainly we pray for all of those individuals who have health issues. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, humble ourselves, recognizing, God, that you are the giver of all things. The things that we have, we owe to you. And we appreciate the life and the support that you provide to us. Lord, we recognize there are those that are real, those that we've prayed for. We continue to pray for those individuals that are suffering from cancer, suffering with heart problems, or just any physical ailment that 
that, that's bothering them, Lord. We know that your hand is involved, will be available to serve them. Lord, we continue to thank you for this congregation, your church. As we assemble here, we ask you to be with us, to guide us, the words that we speak, the things that we have do, the thoughts that we have will be pleasing in your sight. We pray, Lord, that we'll be ever mindful of you while we serve you at this capacity. Lord, continue to be with us with so many that we pray for. We pray for the, uh, the police, the uh, nurses, and the doctors, and all those individuals that are available to help us in a time of need, whether it be physical or whether it be mental or whether it be issues that needed to be dealt with on a daily basis. We continue to pray for the leadership of this country recognizing that there has been some changes. Hopefully, Lord, that that's the, for the best, that we'll recognize that perhaps at this point in the very near future that we will once again return to a God-fearing nation. Lord, you have rich, so richly blessed this country for so many years, and we ask you to continue to do so. We do recognize, Lord, that there is a need for a moral compass, Help those in a position to make those decisions, to recognize that. But Lord, also be with us as citizens, as with believers, that we recognize the opportunities that we have to make a difference, that we speak out, that we'll be bold in those time of need, that we understand, Lord, that we do have that responsibility. Lord, be with us today and always. And we continue to ask you, Lord, that you give us guidance, directions, and help us in the things that we do on a daily basis, recognizing that there is evil in this world, and Lord, we do and need, need your help. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here you go, Abby. Thank you. Watch out. You got it? Let us say a prayer here this morning. Heavenly Father, we recognize that you are the giver of all things. Lord, we recognize also that we have an obligation to return to you those things that are yours. Be with us as we provide contributions, our tithing this morning, that the things that we do with a clear mind and an open heart and free giving. Be with us and guide us in all things. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Gabby, Gabby.
Good morning. Before I forget, uh, when we break for junior church, junior church will be held in the fellowship hall. We've kind of grown with our youth to a point where they've busted out the door in the uh, old church room down there, so we're going to start using the big room. So praise God for that one. Also, Tom mentioned uh, a lot of visitors that we have now as a part of our service where we invite all the visitors forward to come and tell us all your names and all about yourself. <laughs> Just kidding. That's next week. Um, so this morning in Sunday school, you know, we've, we've been on First and Second Kings for 11 weeks now. Uh, in another couple of weeks, we'll be wrapping that series up. And, uh, you know, it's all about, it, it's same old, same old in the Old Testament. And same old, same old all the way to today. You know, everything's good. Um, praise God, lean on God. Everything's good. I've got it from here. I'll handle it. Things start to go downhill. Start to lean back on God. And today was, today was when Israel had turned his back for the last time, and God said, "That's enough. Okay, go. I love you so much that if you don't want to be with me, then you can be without me for now." And uh, you know, there was a line today in the, in the lesson. It's a good one to jot down. Uh, it says that the, the gospel is not about making bad people good. It's about making dead people alive. And with Jesus and following God, even in the Old Testament, it, it's all or nothing. There is no lukewarm. There's no half-hearted. You see, at that point in time, they were, they were worshiping God, the Lord God, but they were also worshiping other idols and gods at the same time. They thought, well, maybe if we... Maybe if we do follow God, then we can, we can kind of do it our way too. It wasn't good enough. It's all or nothing. And that is evident on the cross when God sent his son to die for our sins. God gives us everything. He sacrificed everything for us to have eternal life with him, to be free of sin. So it's only right that we sacrifice everything. We die to our old lives, our sin, to be clothed in the new, to have our new identity in Christ. So let's meditate on that as we prepare to take communion this morning. As always, please hold the elements. We'll, we'll take them together.
It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread and he gave thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as your humble servants. So very grateful for that tremendous sacrifice so many years ago for that broken body taken for the punishment of our sins. It's in Christ's name. He took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the wine and he gave thanks. Again, Father, we come before you as your humble servants. So thankful for that sacrifice, that shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins so we can live in eternity with you in your grace, your glory, and your love. That's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. He poured the wine. He said, this is my blood given freely for you for the forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me.
That is the perfect song to lead into this morning's message. How many of you are worried this morning? Okay, a couple of you are honest. <laughs> I switch glasses here. Told, switching glasses, I told somebody the other day, I'd forgotten my glasses when I preached the revival at, in North Carolina. I said, you know, the younger guys that come out with the skinny jeans and the long hair and all that, they have on their preacher sneakers. But as you age and you mature, you need your preacher glasses. <laughs> but, uh, you know, anxiety and worry and fear are some of the things that keep us from really serving the Lord in the way that we should. And this will wrap up our series on Jesus is the Lord of all with Jesus is the Lord of our anxieties. We're going to be in Luke chapter 12 this morning, beginning with... Um, Verse 22, Luke writes, Then turning to his disciples, Jesus said, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear, for life is more than food and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for God feeds them. And you are more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your Father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it, and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Let's pray this morning. Father in heaven, as we come to your word today, let us take the worries of our everyday life and cast them aside for just a moment. As we listen to hear what it is you have for us this morning, knowing that fear is a liar, and you are the Lord of our anxieties and our worries. Let us always look to you in our time of need. In Jesus' name, amen. This week I looked up the website, theworrycompany.com, the world's leading provider for worrying server. The title page reads, Forget your worries. Your worrying days are over. Let us worry for you and your friends. Our company is dedicated to lifting the burden of worries from your shoulders. By becoming a member of the Worry Company, you officially... Transfer all of your worries to our highly trained professionals who will worry for you. Your worries will be declared null and void. They will be entered into our computerized book of worries for a period of one year, and we will worry for you. We only use certified worriers. <laughs> now, don't you wish it was that easy to get, word, to get rid of worry? By the way, there is no such website. I made that up. <laughs> <laughs> but it might be a good business proposition to get into. <laughs> the next time you worry about your pregnancy, your children, your grandchildren, you just email the worry company and your worries are taken care of. The next time you're churning about financial pressures or job stress, you just turn it over to the worrycompany.com and relax. When you're waiting on the lab results from the biopsy, you just release it to a certified worrier and you'll be cool as a cucumber. And we smile and we chuckle at that idea because we know that it is a gimmick. But Jesus Christ does want to be the Lord of your anxiety. He invites us to cast all of our burdens upon him and he will carry the load for us. Three times in the scripture from Luke 12 that we just read, Jesus said, do not worry. Most of us will admit that we worry, some only occasionally. But for others, it's a career. Worry vary by, varies by degrees from mild to chronic. From some, worry is just a little nervousness that takes the edge off of the day. For others, it's much more serious. Chest pains, dizzy spells, 
panic attacks, nausea, changes in appetite, withdrawing from people, insomnia. Now, if you would classify yourself as a chronic worrier, please understand that it's not wrong to go to a counselor or to go to a doctor. It's not anti-Christian to take prescribed medications. That may be way, God's way of beginning to help you through this process. But Jesus wants us to be free from worry. Our lives are to be characterized by faith, not fear. I want you to see this morning three steps that I see suggested in this passage in Luke 12 that can help us make Jesus Christ the Lord of our anxieties and to live lives free of worry. The first thing I see Jesus saying is, understand that worry is a sin and it can be overcome. When God's word says do not steal or do not commit adultery, we know that to violate those commands is a sin. When Jesus says three times, do not worry, to violate that command is a transgression of his law. We may think of it as a more respectable sin, but worry is indeed a sin. Now, I think it's important that we distinguish, though, between worry and legitimate concern. Concern focuses on probable difficulties and it produces action. But anxiety focuses on improbable difficulties and it produces inaction. Sometimes children will change parents from happy-go-lucky people to worriers. Before kids, we never think about putting electronic eyes on our electric garage door opener or those little plastic caps over the electric outlets. In my childhood days, you put a penny in that outlet once and you learn your lesson. Your worry was over. <laughs> but Jesus isn't saying here to just live haphazard lives. Don't be concerned about a safety on a garage door. You don't need to buy in life insurance or install smoke alarms. I'll take care of everything. He taught us to count the cost of building a tower before we begin. He taught us to learn from the ant who worked hard to store up food for the winter. And often the best cure for worry is to take action. You're worried about the test? You study. You're worried about your finances? You work on a new budget. You're worried about your health? You go to the doctor. You're worried about your marriage? You make sacrifices. That's not worry. That's legitimate concern that results in action. But anxiety focuses on uncontrollable, improbable circumstances and takes no action. Anxiety is always asking, what if? What if the stock market crashes? What if I get cancer? What if my kid's marriage falls apart? What if the company goes bankrupt? What if my grandchildren gets in, grandchild gets in an accident? What ifs are things that we can't control and we can't change? And Jesus said, don't be anxious like that. Now, there are several reasons that Jesus advises that. One is that worry wastes time and energy. Worry is kind of like racing your car engine when the transmission's in neutral. You're wasting gas and you're just not going anywhere. In verse 25, Jesus says, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? One study showed that the average person's anxiety is focused on 40% on things that will never happen, 30% on things from the past that cannot be changed, 12% on other people's opinions that cannot be controlled, and 10% of worries about health, which only gets worse when we worry. Only 8% of worry is on real problems that we face. So that means that 92% of the time, worry is about things that we have no control over, and that's a waste of time. Corey Ten Boom said, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, it empties today of its strength. You worry and you could have been sleeping. You could have been enjoying the game. You could have been deepening relationships. How many times have you said, I wish I could go back and relive that day? It turned out to be such a wonderful day and all I did that day was worry. Worry also impairs our personality. When you're constantly fretting and worrying about something, you're no fun to live with. You're somber, critical, negative, withdrawn, inattentive. Arthur Somers Roach wrote, Worry is a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. If encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. Worry impairs our personality. Worry also erodes your health. 
There are all kinds of physical ailments that are stress-related. Ulcers, heart attacks, high blood pressure, insomnia. Worry gives you wrinkles, premature aging, maybe even gray hair or receding hair or no hair. <laughs> Worry harms our witness too. The doctor said that before he became a Christian, he and his co-workers observed that many preachers who came to them for heart ailments were terrified of dying. He said those worried preachers turned some of the doctors off to Christianity because it didn't seem to be working in the lives of those preachers. In Luke 12, verses 11 and 12, Jesus said, When you are brought to trial in the synagogues and before rulers and authorities, don't worry about how to defend yourself or what to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what needs to be said. If you worry too much about how you're coming across as a witness, you're, not, you're liable not to say anything out of fear. And Jesus says, don't worry about that. The Holy Spirit will give you what you should say. Or if you're anxious about bad things happening to you, it's evidence to the world that you don't believe what you say you believe. Worry often distorts our judgment and results in wrong behavior. People can do some pretty stupid things when they're under stress. A man bought a brand new car and realized after a few months that he wouldn't be able to make the payments. And he worried that if he let the car be repossessed, his credit rating would be ruined. So he decided to deliberately wreck his car and total it so the insurance company would cover the debt. So he goes out on a lonely, lonely country road where no one would see him and the man purposely drove the car into a tree at 35 miles an hour. He got out of the car uninjured, assessed the damage to it, and realized that it might not be totaled. So he backed the car up and ran into the tree again. <laughs> then he called the police. After about 30 minutes, the police showed up and asked what happened. The man said, I must have fallen asleep, ran off the road, and hit the tree. And the policeman said, that's interesting. We received a call from a farmer working in that field next to us. And he said a man ran into a tree, backed up, and ran into it again. <laughs> that wouldn't be you, would it? And then the policeman sternly told the man, if you try to turn this accident into your insurance company, you'll be arrested for fraud. So now the man has car, car payments he can't make and a car that he can't drive. You see, worry skews our judgment, and it just compounds our problems. But here's the biggest reason that worry is a sin. Worry insults God. The primary reason that we're anxious is that we want to control everything about our lives rather than to trust God for the future. And Jesus said when we think that way, we're behaving like the pagans who don't know God at all. If God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Your Father knows what you need, and He will supply it. This is why worry is a sin. Worry calls God a liar. Worry says, God, I don't believe that you'll do what you've promised to do. God says, I'll supply all of your needs. And worry says, don't think you will. God says, in the end, I will see to it that all things work together for good for those who love me. Worry says, I don't think that'll be my experience. I don't think you'll keep your promise, God. God says, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. And worry says, I don't know what will happen to me when I die. That's why Oswald Chambers says, worry is spiritual infidelity. We do not believe that God looks out for the details of our lives. But worry, even though it's a sin, can be overcome. We're inclined to say, you know, I, even the, I'm a warrior. I've always been a warrior. It's in my genes. My mother was always a warrior. It's just the way I am. But Jesus never commands us to do something that we can't control. And he said for us to quit worrying. Jesus wants his people to be calm. And some of us here today may need to go to our knees and say, God, I've been faithless. I've sinned. I ask your forgiveness, and I ask through the power of your Holy Spirit that I would overcome this problem of worry. The Apostle Paul said, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. 
Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. That doesn't mean that you'll never be tempted to worry again. But it does mean that when the temptation arises, you can have victory over it. The second counsel Jesus gives us in this passage is to develop a realistic trust in the providence of God. Jesus said that God is so good that he provided the daily needs for the least significant of his creation. Look at the ravens. Nobody wants to have ravens around. A raven's a scavenger that feeds on dead animals. They're some of the least appreciated of all the birds. But you never see a raven pacing on a tree limb at night, wondering if there's going to be any roadkill out there tomorrow. You can watch the Animal Channel for months, and they'll never show you a raven's nest with a storage nest attached to it. They're not storing meat for the next day. Yet a raven has enough to eat every day. And Jesus is telling us, if God's caring for the least of his creatures, and you are so much more valuable than birds, don't you think he'll take care of you? Jesus goes on to say, look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. Roses require a lot of attention. They have to be cut back, fertilized, sprayed, protected from the frost, except for ours. I know, ours grows all the time. <laughs> but lilies in Palestine, they just grow in the wild. They cover the hillsides and they're beautiful. They don't need any attention, no cultivation, no overseer. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? You are much more important than flowers and birds. And Jesus is asking, how much evidence do you have to have in your lifetime before you conclude that God is taking care of you? How many times are you going to sit down at the table to eat when you're hungry until you say, you know what? God's cared for me and given me enough to eat all of these years. I think I'll always have enough to eat. How many articles of clothing are going to have to hang in your closet before you say, you know what? God is going to provide me enough to wear. How many nights will you go to bed with a roof over your head and a secure place to sleep before you say, I'm always going to have some place to sleep? How many prayers have to be answered in your life before you say, you know what? God really is taking care of me. How much stuff are you going to have to accumulate before you say, that's enough. I'm content. I have all that I need. But we do need to be realistic. Our trust needs to be real. God's providence does not mean exemption from difficulty. Consider the birds. Do you know what happens to birds? If you have cats or foxes in your neighborhood, you know what happens. The feathers in your yard are the proof. Birds die. Birds' eggs get eaten. And sometimes birds get attacked by other birds. Or consider the lilies of the field. What happens to them? They're here today, and tomorrow they're thrown into the fire. Our trust needs to be realistic. Some people will tell you the best way to overcome worry is just put it out of your mind. Just don't think about it and nothing bad's going to happen. But if that's your approach, then your peace is going to be short-lived. The best way to overcome worry is to face the truth. People do die. Couples get divorced. Kids have accidents. Stocks plunge. Companies go bankrupt. Horrible things happen in this world. But the Lord says, I'm not going to exempt you from the difficulties outside, but I'm going to reinforce you from within so that whatever happens, you'll be able to stand up underneath it. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You see, a young woman who wants to get pregnant knows that there's going to be discomfort, that there's going to be pain, but she wants the end result, so she'll endure the pain. And the providence of God is not shallow, telling us that everything's going to be fine, no need to worry. God's providence means 
God is going to reinforce me no matter what comes my way. That's why I love 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Buck's favorite verse. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Corey Tinboom says that when she was a teenager, a friend of the family was arrested and persecuted by the Nazis for being a Christian. Corey said to her father, I don't think I could do that. I would deny Christ. I don't have enough faith to endure that. And her father said, no, Corey, if that happens to you, God will give you more faith. Then Corey said, I don't think that I'm strong enough. And her father said, Corey, do you remember when you were a little girl and we took that ride on the train? When did I give you your ticket? She said, just before I got on the train. And her father said, that's right. I had the ticket the whole time, but I did not give it to you until you needed it. God has all these resources and he only gives, and he only gives you more when you need more. And if you've read the book, The Hiding Place, you know that when Corey Ten Boom was arrested and tortured in the Nazi prison camp, she had a marvelous testimony. Trusting God's providence does not mean a shallow, he's not going to let anything bad happen to me. It's saying that whatever happens, even death, he's going to give me enough strength to get through when it comes. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Understand and have a realistic view of the providence of God. His eyes on the sparrow and the lilies of the field. And you can know that he watches over and reinforces you. And the final thing I see Jesus teaching here is to keep a spiritual focus every day. The reason we worry is that we've got our focus only on this world. Don't be concerned about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and He will give you everything you need. If your, focus is on, if your primary focus is on financial security, it doesn't matter how much insurance you have, or how many things you accumulate, you're going to worry about them because you cannot co totally control them. If your primary per focus is on your health, it doesn't matter how much you exercise or how much oatmeal you eat, you're going to worry about your health because you're getting older. If your primary focus is on your children, I guarantee you will worry about them all your life because you cannot control them. But Jesus is saying, Get your focus off of this world and onto the kingdom of God because that's permanent. Lay up treasure in heaven and put your heart there. That will eliminate worry. Let's say that you have an old tree beside your house that's dead. It's dangerous because you know it's going to fall on your house. So you call Robin Rush Tree Service and they tell you that they'll be there in two weeks. The, ne <laughs> the next day you see a robin building a nest in that tree. What do you do? You go out and you have a little talk with that robin and you'd say, don't build your nest here. The tree's going to be cut down in two weeks. Your eggs will not be hatched by then. Go build your nest in another tree that's more permanent. And if the robin doesn't cooperate, you would probably be so mean that you would go out and remove that nest each night. And that robin would go home each night and tell her husband, you wouldn't believe what that mean homeowner did to me today. But you're actually trying to help the robin. And now God is saying to you, don't build your nest in the trees of this world because they're all marked for the axe. And if you're getting your focus and your heart on this world only, you're going to have worry and anxiety. But when you put your treasure in heaven, that's where your heart will be also. Don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Seek his kingdom and all these things will be given to you as well. C.S. Lewis said, you aim at heaven and you get the world thrown in. You aim at the world and you get neither. So how can we develop that spiritual focus? First of all, if you've not already done so, become a Christian. 
If your sins are not forgiven and you don't have the promise of eternal life, you need to be concerned and you need to take action. You need to confess Jesus as Savior and Lord. Allow the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse your sin and be baptized into him so you know you have the promise of eternal life. Then worship Jesus regularly. One of the reasons that we come to church regularly is to get our focus on things that are above. Max Licato writes, I was sitting in church on Easter Sunday. During the communion service, I heard from the row behind me the sweet voice of a young boy. What's that, Daddy? The father's voice was deep and kind. These are crackers. They help us remember Jesus' death on the cross. I chuckled at the impossible assignment of explaining the Lord's Supper to a child. The question continued with the cup of juice. What's that, Daddy? It's grape juice. It reminds us of the blood of Jesus, the father began. Then he went on the best he could to explain what the emblems meant. After a few moments, I turned to both see who the father was and to give him a knowing smile. As it turned out, the father was David Robinson. On his lap was was six-year-old David Jr. The night before, David Robinson had led the San Antonio Spurs to an NBA playoff victory over the Phoenix Suns. Within 24 hours, he would be in Arizona trying to do it again. Both games would be broadcast on national television and seen by millions of people. But David would be the first to tell you that neither contest compared to the precious moments he had with his son on Easter Sunday. Years from now, long after the headlines have faded and the games have been forgotten, it won't matter who won or lost on the basketball court. What will matter is that this young boy had a daddy who told him about Jesus Christ. Ruth Graham said, fear and faith cannot be in the same heart. Worship and worry are mutually exclusive. That's why we sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's why we come here to worship. Just to remember that the world out there is not really our home. We're just passing through. The third way to get your focus on the things that are above is to review God's promises. If I struggled with worry, I think I would write certain scriptures in the flyleaf of my Bible, right inside the cover. When anxious times came, I would reread those promises. Psalm 3, verses 5 and 6, I lay down and slept, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. I'm not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. Psalm 46, 1 and 2, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and mountains crumble into the sea. Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. I would write those promises down. I would review them. I'd memorize them. And then after I got done, I would ask myself, do I believe what I say I believe? If I believe this, then I'm going to turn my worries over to the Lord. Another thing Jesus says to do in this passage is to lay up treasure in heaven. God commands us to give our possessions away, not because the church needs it or because the poor need it, And certainly not because God needs it, but because we need it. Sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven, and the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe, no thief can steal it, and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. We're to hold on to the things of this earth loosely. When you're anxious about finances, one of the best things to do is to start giving some of it away, just as a reminder that this world is not your home. And finally, learn the art of living one day at a time. The birds go to sleep every night, not knowing what's going to be out there the next day. God provides for them. The flowers are here today and gone tomorrow. I will be too. 
In Matthew 6, Jesus said, Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Somebody said, Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift from God. That's why it's called the present. And folks, we're so spoiled. We think in our minds that life is supposed to be worry-free. No pressure. And if you're waiting for those times in life when you, when you have no stress, no pressure, you're going to waste 98% of your life. The key to living the victorious, abundant life that Jesus Christ wants us to live is to say with the psalmist, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I can't change yesterday. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But God is permitting me to be alive today. And even though I have some pressure, I'm going to live it to the fullest. When you repent of worry and turn your burden over to the Lord and you trust him for the future and you really focus on the spiritual, you find out that he's the one who's certified to carry your burden for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we spend so much of our time worrying about things that we really don't need to worry about. You have the future laid out for each one of us. There's a great plan for each one of us. And while worrying may not take that plan away, it certainly keeps us from realizing the fulfillment of that plan, the way that you have laid it out. Lord, let us turn our anxieties and our worries over to you. And let us focus on the things that have eternal significance and consequences to them. Lord, let us be faithful to you. Forgive us when we've fallen short and when we do worry and become anxious. And Lord, we know that the best way to, to overcome, to start to overcome that worry is to make you the Lord of our life, the Lord of our anxieties. Lord, if there's one who needs to do that today, let today be the day that they turn their anxieties and worries over to you and turn their life over to you and begin, begin to live the abundant life that you've called them to. Lord, we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.
again soon. Um, announcements on the board next week, next Sunday, wear your stretchy pants. <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner will be after the service. Always a good time, always a good time of fellowship, always good, good food. Linda's waiting to say something about that. from the kitchen. Um, there's some soup and sandwiches and some of the things from the country store. Please help yourself and just drop a donation in the jar. Did I miss anything? Oh, one other thing. We have our list up there to sign up to come and have dinner next week. If you think you might be wanting to stay, sign your name. That's so we make sure we have enough turkey and stuffing for everyone. And um, if you have to announce it for at home, to call in the office if they yes. would like. And we have both eat in and take out if you need to take yeah. it out if you're not comfortable sitting around a bunch of people to eat. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you, Linda. Uh, for those who couldn't hear online, if you, if you want to come to the meal next week, just call the office, let us know how many, and whether you'll be eating in or taking a meal home with you, either one will be fine. No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> On the subject of next Sunday's meal, moms and dads, if you look at the youth group schedule, you'll notice that uh, it does reflect that next Sunday was to be a youth group day. We're going to reschedule that for the 27th. Uh, be on the lookout. We'll announce that on Facebook and whatnot as well. Uh, I do believe that Kathy Schiffler is still going to have a, a run through of the program that day, however. So just be on the lookout for that announcement. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. The Christmas concert will be December 4th. There's some flyers out in the foyer. If you want to take some of those with you, hang them up in stores, things like that, that would be great. Uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for, for who you are. Lord, for all you've done for us. Lord, just thank you for the promise that you will take our worries and our anxieties from us if we let you. Lord, we just pray that you would give us boldness and grace as we come to, in contact with those this week that you, that you have placed in our path to share the gospel with, the good news of salvation through your Son. It's in his name I pray. Amen.